Okay, it's my sincere pleasure today to introduce Louis Bernache as our speaker. Now, if there was ever a story of local youngster makes good, it's the story of uh, Louis Bernache. Louis was born in Lac Frontier, which is uh, near the Quebec main border, and he finished his PhD uh, at Laval in 1990 and did uh, postdoc at Montpellier and then a postdoc with uh, where he is currently a CRC1 chair in a brief his work is the uh, and questions that he addresses. He has a long-standing and well-regarded research program in the geography and uh, to the genomics of speciation using Lake Whitefish as a model system. He's done a whole pile of uh, fascinating stories, uh, not stories, uh, research projects. Yeah, stories, stories. stories. <laughs> That's what's great about them is they actually tell a story. A good story, but it's not storytelling. You know what I mean? Anyway, about <laughs> uh, the evolution of population structure, or in some cases, the lack thereof, including a lot of empirical and uh, analytical technique development. And he's also done a huge number of really, really important uh, studies on the use of genetics and genomics in uh, resource, man to help, uh, resource management in terms of aquatic resources. By telling Christine he was the winner. So we've had two prize winners. Uh, and without further ado, Louis, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, it's a great pleasure to be here. First coming cookies are really excellent and just just so many good friends here. So it's just good to be to be at UBC for a little while. Just get out that out of the way. So yeah, we've done some stuff in the lab, so basic, but I decided not to talk too much about our own stuff. So I'm going to talk about other people's stuff, but a little bit of our own, own stuff. And I'm, I'm using, using this context of um, adaptive potential in the face of environmental change just to tell you, um, tell you things that I'm interested in these days from, from the literature and see where we're going in terms of understanding uh, selection and, um, and, um, and how organisms can manage to maintain uh, adaptive potential in the face of, of environmental change. And with a focus on fish, but not necessarily only on fish, not to be too fishy. Some people don't like it when it's too fishy. Um, all right, so I guess it's new, no news for, for anybody here that species are experiencing, experiencing drastic changes uh, as a result of uh, human activities, and that basically relate to the green, <coughs> greenhouse gas that cause change in temperature, but for orga uh, aquatic organisms, uh, among others, that comes with other challenges, ocean acidifications, extremes in drought and flood conditions, habitat alterations, pollution, invasive species, novel pathogens, selective harvesting. So aquatic uh, uh, organisms, they're in trouble. So basically, I guess we're truly witnessing a global evolutionary experiment with substantial socioeconomic cost and direct effects of biodiversity. And as a consequence, <coughs> understanding how organisms respond, may respond to human-driven uh, environmental change should be uh, of uh, major concern. Basically, there are three and non-exclusive options by which organisms can cope with a changing environment. They can acclimate to shifting conditions via phenotypic plasticity. They can shift their, uh, their distribution via uh, d dispersal. But the ultimate response is adaptation to environmental uh, conditions. But there are issues with understanding adaptation to these <laughs> new conditions. So basically, there has been quite a bit of controversy and uncertainty surrounding inferences of uh, adaptive evolution, as opposed, for example, as a mere plastic response to, uh, to a new, new environmental conditions. <coughs> 
<coughs> and basically the problem is this. Uh, ultimately, to, to, uh, to confirm that there's adaptive evolution on the go, we need genetic evidence. And, but it has been very, typically very challenging to link uh, adaptive phenotypic change to change at, uh, at the gene level. And there are various uh, reasons for that. <laughs> but as a consequence, the genetic underpinnings, although things are changing and there are, you know, there are uh, new data coming in and that are great studies, but for the, in the general sense, the geni uh, genetic underpinnings of fitness-related traits uh, are still poorly uh, documented. And the history behind that is that for, for quite some time, most studies that were interested <laughs> by understanding adaptive response to, uh, to new environment uh, basically focus on measuring phenotypic response as opposed to response at the genomic level uh, as in association with fitness. And the main reason for that is that until quite recently, the actual um, uh, resources necessary to investigate the genetic basis of adaptation uh, essentially lacked power. But of course, things are changing and uh, related to the, well, still recent development uh, uh, in genomics, which now provide unprecedented insight into evolutionary processes and the molecular basis uh, of adaptation. <coughs> so essentially, there are three, uh, three main ways, if you want, by which the uh, genomics can improve things uh, towards, the, towards this end. Uh, new genomics approaches allow scaling up genome coverage for basically any uh, model or non-model species, and the main one of the main interests into that is that that leads towards improving estimates of population and evolutionary parameters, um, <laughs> improve definitely uh, efficiency in finding regions in the genomes uh, that count from an adaptive standpoint and moving towards also more, a more integrative approach uh, uh, with the goal of elucidating the adaptive significance of molecular variation. <laughs> and, and ultimately, we want that to lead us to understand causal relationship between genetic variation, phenotypic variation, and the environment. And in the conservation context, uh, ultimately, what we're after, I guess, is to be able to predict the future dynamics of selectively important variation and potential for adaptation to uh, these new uh, conditions. <laughs> but of course, just genomic data in itself or would not be sufficient for predicting evolutionary potential of species in the future. What we need for that, we need models that will integrate parameters allowing to predict the potential for adaptive responses uh, in a given environmental context. But as pointed out by uh, Rachel B. and collaborators last year, <laughs> genome-wide data have been so far very rarely integrated into current theoretical uh, modeling frameworks such that currently there's kind of an existing gap between two main lines of inquiries. On one side, what are population genomic studies telling us about the potential evolutionary change uh, in existing population? And on the other side, do these findings may match existing theory and, uh, and models? So that's kind of a crossroad there. <coughs> and um, again, reviewed in, uh, in Bay and collaborators recently, Basically, models that pertain to, um, to environmental adaptation commonly assume that phenotypic traits uh, are controlled by single genes driven by the fix uh, that will, uh, single gene that will be driven to fixation by a strong selection associated with new environmental conditions. So basically, this has been, this way of viewing has been largely influenced by what's so-called the quantitative <laughs> trait nucleotide program that has been criticized, among others, by, uh, by, uh, by Rockman, because it perhaps be, can be a too narrow way of seeing things. But anyway, this way of seeing, <laughs> of seeing um, things being driven by genes of large effects and being driven to sel selection by, by a strong selection associated with uh, new environmental conditions kind of project a gloomy perspective of the, of the potential of a species to cope with future conditions. And basically, that's can illustrate that by some sort of a cartoon showing that if you have like strong selection acting on those genes of strong effect, then, well, you'll have reduction in population size associated with the cost of selection that will drive a uh, pronounced reduction of diversity like leading to, fi to fixation, gene fixation, reducing the evolutionary potential and increasing the risk of uh, extinction to, of, of species. But the point is that this
capacity to retain their evolution potential. <laughs> After all, we know that organisms can sometimes adapt surprisingly quickly to new environmental conditions, so there's got to be some variation there upon which a selection can adapt. And that may happen even when census sizes are very small, for example, in domestic breeds. And we now know that there's a prevailing role for standing genetic uh, variation in adaptation. So there's variation being maintained in populations in the long term. So clearly there are mechanisms by which genetic variation and evolutionary potential can be maintained in natural populations. <coughs> so that's basically what I, I want to talk about for the rest of the talk. Just discuss several of these uh, mechanisms that may enhance the maintenance of genetic, but I want to say something also about epigenetic variation and evolutionary potential. So basically, these mechanisms are uh, prevalence of soft sweeps, polygenic basis of adaptation, balancing selection. Is this me? Sorry, Okanagan. All right, so balancing selection and epigenetic variation. Prevalence of some, uh, and then I will support that by largely from some example from, the, from uh, the fish literature showing that species may be able to retain more variation in evolutionary potential that currently assume, but some example outside the, the fish planet as well. <coughs> Prevalence of soft sweeps. Of course, that does not exclude the occurrence of hard sweeps. We know that they exist. And uh, they're certainly occur in, in nature. They are a great classical example of that. Color uh, variation in, in the pepper moth, like the one gene associated with that have been identified and show alternate fixation between, uh, between the pepper moth of the different colors. Cold color variation in, in mice, great work from uh, Hopi Extras group, that, that now more 10 years ago. And of course, reduction of armor plates associated with uh, the EDA genes in stickleback. <laughs> but there are theoretical and empirical reason to suspect that hard sweeps, which is like large effect QTNs, if you want, are not the most informative to explain general evolutionary phenomena. And that was, again, the point was made by Rockman and others. For example, as far as human populations are concerned, fixed differences among human populations are exceptionally rare and very, very uh, found, rarely found. And the most well-known example of rapid molecular adaptation in human population of self-selective sweeps rather than, than hard sweeps. <coughs> um, as a case in point with, uh, with fish, um, I would argue that soft sweeps uh, dominate really what we see in the literature. So that's an example of uh, people that are playing with genomic data. They're, they're used to one, this type of genome scan or various versions of it. <laughs> whereby basically you scan the genome if, the, if each point representing uh, a marker across the genome <laughs> and then you seek statistically to identify those outliers that stand out in terms of extent of differentiation between your population and you want to make the inference that, uh, that uh, these outliers uh, actually uh, represent uh, are the results of divergent selection between uh, locally adapted population. But the point I want to make here is that very, 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 very rarely, if any, you'll see uh, allelic fixation in that, that type of study. So if you have an intermediate value of FST, basically what it means, it means you're just playing with allele frequency of the same variation. There's no variation being lost here. You're just playing with different frequencies in different populations, <coughs> which can be associated with adaptation, but without fixation. And those are just representative values in um, the fish literature. Could have, I'm sure I could have generated the same sort of thing with birds or trees. Um, so it's just the range of values for, of FST for, out, uh, for um, markers as, uh, labeled as being outliers, so being under potentially divergent selection. So you see that the range of values, sometimes you get close to one, but even there, you're, you're not losing the alternate variation. and remains there. <coughs> It's only in some extreme cases, for example, where you will see, you, will, you can see potentially alternate fix, uh, fixation, but most of the time that will be associated with really advanced case of divergence. Actually, you're basically at the, at the threshold of, of species or, or even at the biological species steps such that you can have genomic incompatibilities be, being involved. 
uh, in the con also in the context of ecological speciation, like in <coughs> various pairs of, st of uh, sticklebacks. So the whitefish I've been working on, cichlids uh, in the marine environment, or European anchovies. But those would be like very extreme and very, uh, I'd say, exceptional situations. So, but overall, um, what I get from the literature is that adaptation proceeds by shift in frequencies of allele, but they remain, they remain shared between differentially adapted population. There's no variation lost. <laughs> so that's just kind of a parenthesis about genome scan because most of us that in finding signal of selection, we do that by these genome scans methods and try to find outliers. But there's new studies <laughs> that um, kind of warning us that to be very, very careful in the way we interpret uh, genome scans and that probably the best illustration of that it's another great piece of work from uh, Hans Hellegren uh, group on, on, uh, on the Fisidula uh, flycatcher. So basically what they've done, they, they're doing whole genome resequencing and of, uh, of various, uh, um, various uh, flycatcher species that diverge in various points in, in evolutionary time, millions of years in some cases. <laughs> but the point is that if you do pairwise comparison of um, overall genomic divergence between these, between these species, you, there's a kind of a general pattern that emerged, which is, which is basically for any of these pairwise comparison re, uh, represented by uh, different colors here, uh, peaks where outliers will show up in the genome, they are the same. They're in the same positions on, on different chromosomes, <laughs> and which basically makes no sense from an adaptive point of view because it's not a uh, comparison between these two species or this species and this species doesn't have to be like the same genes being involved here. They are in a different type of environment, different geographic region and so on. <coughs> kind of these recurrent patterns that sh will show the same um, region of the genome showing uh, consistently like the highest level of, of divergence. Like this one example here comparing FST between a pairwise comparison of species versus another uh, pairwise comparison and you have this positive correlation when you have f high FST values in this comparison you'll have a high FST value in this comparison. <laughs> and they found out that, in, that overall that relates to recombination rate. So, which, so you'll have an inverse relationship between the level of genetic differentiation and uh, recombination rate uh, across, and recom there's variation, but overall recom variation in recombination rate across the genome tend to remain the same for the different species. That's the, the point they're making. <laughs> Such that their interpretation is that the, those patterns of outliers or high level of differentiation uh, is more like a direct prediction of link selection in low recombination re uh, regions uh, among which the recombination landscape is being conserved over millions and millions of years, such that the effect of link selection in heterogeneous recombination landscape should be taken into account to formulate appropriate null models to reliably identify genome, uh, genomic region involved uh, either in speciation or adaptation. So that's a very important message <laughs> because basically it's really make a strong point. I guess there's other papers that shows that, but it really makes a strong point that, uh, that link selection independent of adaptation has a lot to do with variation in level of differentiation that we see across the genome. Anyway, that was just a parenthesis I thought could be relevant. <laughs> so moving to polygenic uh, basis of adaptation. Again, this is something I guess that we all know, but uh, too often being ignored in the literature is that evolution perhaps most often acts uh, via large numbers of small effect polygenes. And polygenic selection, uh, the point again with the maintenance of, uh, of uh, genetic variation, <coughs> is that polygenic selection is not expected to lead to, fix to, um, to fixation. Uh, instead, the way uh, polygenic selection will operate would cause small co-varying changes among many loci, uh, so mi minor changes in allele frequencies that will co-vary, but across a high number of loci. So this type of selection is not expected to to, uh, to lead to lo uh, loss of genetic variation. <laughs> a good example of, um, of a po highly polygenic trait and how it works, human height, and what has been called the missing heritability, because on one side, based on uh, classical quantitative genetics, uh, human height is a very highly heritable trait with the heritability up to uh, 
but classical uh, GWAS, like genome-wide association studies, looking for association between single marker at a time and variation in human height, has not been able to explain more than 5% of the variation in human height. So it's quite, quite a contrast in, explain, in the, uh, the amount of explained uh, variance. <laughs> but with the same, uh, and that was even with new, very, very, like a very detailed and very, uh, um, very um, high resolution uh, studies with uh, hundreds of thousands and step and dozens of thousands of individuals. But looking at these same data set, but more like in the multivariate polygenic type of analysis, <laughs> the other authors could explain up to 45% of the variation, meaning that this, this, this is more closer to the reality of the genetic, uh, genetic genomic basis uh, explaining variation in this, uh, in this uh, phenotypic trait. And very, very recently, uh, Jonathan Preachers and some of his colleagues are actually pushing <laughs> that even further with, um, uh, with, with data to support that. So basically, as, as in terms of human height, they're arguing that there are probably more than 100,000 SNP <laughs> that exert independent causal effect on, on this trait. And if you had other uh, polygenic traits, adaptive polygenic traits, <laughs> control in a, that could be potentially controlled in a similar manner in the genome, so Pritchard is making the point that possibly or the whole genome is possibly evolving under, uh, under selection. So that leads him to propose that we're moving from polygenic to omnigenic, basically, meaning that the whole genome somewhere, somehow, is, is, a, a ver, ver, is involved, well, not directly necessarily involved in causal traits, but you have, have that many region for a single trait with a link selection around, surrounding them and so on, you, end, you may end up with having the whole genome evolving somewhere, somehow, under the effect of selection. So one uh, example from uh, the work we've been doing in the lab related to evidence for polygenic basis of adaptation is uh, this work we have done on uh, American eel uh, and studying specially varying selection and genomic differentiation uh, between uh, saltwater and freshwater uh, eel ecotypes. So a little bit of biology, eel biology one. <laughs> so American eel, they all spawn in a single, well, this is a huge spawning area, it's for a reproductive area, but that's the Sargasso Sea, but they all, there's only a single uh, geographic area where eel can reproduce, and this is a Sargasso Sea. Larvae hatches, and they are passively, passively drift into the, into the Gulf Stream, and eventually, through, uh, at a later developmental stage, they will, they will move towards the, towards the coast and will colonize uh, Either they, they will colonize uh, inland freshwater all the way from the subtropics to the subarctic, or they will also they may also remain uh, along the coast and spend their entire life in brackish and salt water. So you have this this uh, dichotomy, but eventually they will sexually mature and they will all go back to the Sargasso Sea, and they will reproduce there and uh, they will die. So they are it's a truly somniparous uh, species. <coughs> so. As a result of that, they're all going back to the same place and, same place and spawning at the same time. So at uh, uh, patterns of genetic differentiation by life stages, sampling site, cohort, et cetera, et cetera you, you end up with essentially no, well, no, differenti no differentiation uh, at all. So that's definitely like the best negative result we generated in, in the lab, I would say. <laughs> and in, so this dichotomy of, uh, of uh, they want to end up living in freshwater as opposed to this coastal brackish area is also associated in the general this variation to that, but in this uh, in this dichotomy. So you have the the um, the freshwater eel. Uh, the general pattern is that they are very slow growing, but they will live for a very long time. Such that when they they are sexually mature by the age of 20, 25, or 30 years of age, they will be they will they will be very large eel, but not because of fast growth because they are old. Whereas the coastal eel, they have a very uh, uh, fast growth rate relative to, to those, and, but they will sexually mature uh, at the age of three, four, five, six years of age. So the average adult size will be much smaller than uh, the, fresh, uh, the freshwater eel. And there's a strong tendency also for freshwater eels to be uh, dominated by females as opposed to, as opposed to males. So there's this, that big uh, 
phenotypic dichotomy, if you want, between the two main habitat uh, types. <laughs> so we were interested to see if this was associated with, uh, with uh, genetic differentiation, knowing that we are in the, in the context of panmixia, if there was genetic differentiation, should be associated with, with uh, specially varying selection, so favoring uh, the maintenance of some genotypes in one type of habitat and other genotypes in other types of habitat. So we compare <laughs> eels from, uh, from freshwater and eight saltwater uh, sites, some of them being geographically uh, close to each, uh, to each other. And this was work being done with uh, rad sequencing techniques. Anyway, the point is that we were working, let's say, with 40,000 uh, markers. Overall, showing an FST of, uh, of zero uh, again. Previous numbers were obtained from microsatellites I was showing you. <laughs> and then we used random forest algorithm uh, to identify the most discriminant markers, if there was discrimination to be, between uh, all uh, samples from the freshwater and all samples from... Um, uh, uh, from salt brackish water. So that's the main, uh, I'll make a short, uh, long story short, that's the main result, <laughs> the heat map showing uh, differences in allele frequencies at uh, 30, 300 uh, something uh, markers that were identified as being in the um, uh, random forest uh, language the most important in discriminating eels from both, uh, from, uh, both environments. So basically we could cluster all eels from the freshwater sampling site uh, different from the eels from the saltwater uh, brackish uh, sampling sites based on variation <laughs> of, of, um, of these uh, uh, at these uh, low site. And this was all like very slight differences in allele frequencies, but co-varying in the same manner, so creating this, di this dichotomy. And we could, uh, we could um, uh, blindly re reassign eels with a 90% 90 90 success rate to their, to their habitat, either freshwater or uh, saltwater. And then with this and some uh, functional inference we could make also based on uh, where the markers were uh, in the genome, then genes that they were associated with. So the general conclusion to that was that spatially varying uh, polygenic selection produce local functional genetic differences despite penmixia. <laughs> so that's, a, that's an illustration of, um, of uh, how selection can operate in a polygenic manner to create these differences uh, between freshwater and saltwater. And of course, uh, when these fish go back to the Sargasso Sea, they will all randomly mate together, and all of that will be reshuffled. All the, so all the genetic composition will all be random uh, related to where the, the young eel will end up in the next generation, and this process of selection will, uh, uh, will uh, occur again. So we look at things also on, uh, on uh, another um, environmental um, gradient, which is uh, temperature from north to south along, uh, along the coast. And in this study, um, which should probably be accepted soon, hopefully, um, again, it's a rad sequencing uh, study. So this time we work with, uh, with baby eels. They're called glass eels. And <laughs> this is how they look like when, they, when they, um, they, they leave the ocean and they approach the coast. And so the samples here were, um, were collected as soon as the first wave of these glass seals uh, are being, uh, are being um, can be collected at different point of time in different, uh, different locations uh, along, along the U.S. Canadian coast. And we use a different statistical uh, framework there. So we used redundancy analysis first to see if there was, uh, if there was variation, variation in the genetic makeup of eels from different locations. Uh, associated with uh, with uh, some uh, environmental variables, so I'll just I'll just focus on temperature. We just consider other things, but uh, um, and then uh, and then uh, so yes, there were so so the the, the there was um, uh, the, there was a variation observed among uh, among sampling location uh, genetic variation that was associated with variation uh, of temperature. So to go to the next step. We, uh, we just basically put an arbitrary threshold of 0.5% uh, to retain like the, uh, basically the most, uh, the, the, the low side that were uh, the most uh, explanatory in generating this pattern of variation among sampling sites. And that ended up with uh, 197 uh, markers. And so we used the um, polygenic scores method that was uh, <laughs> developed and applied by Gagnier and uh, Oscar Gagliotti recently. 
And uh, so basically the point here is that for among all of these uh, 197 markers, you just, <laughs> you, um, you ju basically you sum up the number of alleles that pos positively uh, are, are uh, is a positively associated with a change in, in one of these uh, uh, environmental factors. So in this case, let's do this example uh, with water temperature. And then so we look at, the, path, uh, at the, the variation between the polygenic score of each individuals for at each location, so each lines of dots representing a sampling location. So we could explain 40% of the, of the variation uh, of the polygenic score in association with the uh, uh, with, uh, the water temperature being encountered by the glass seal when they approach the coast at each of these, uh, these locations. So the best uh, uh, interpretation of that is that, again, spatially varying selection operate differently uh, because of different temperature, uh, thermal regime that uh, the glass seal encounter at different places along the coast <laughs> that generate selection uh, differentially, differentially in different, in different locations generating this pattern of uh, genetic variation, despite the fact that uh, we are in a situation of total panmixia. <laughs> so the overall message related to this of adaptation is that it's probably wise to combine methods to detect both signal of large, because they do exist, and this not, the point is not to say that it's irrelevant, but we, most, we put all of our, uh, our emphasis on this, and we forget about this. So it's probably good to just to do both. <coughs> Balancing selection. So best thing is to start with a quote of Mike. If Mike says something, it has to be the truth. So I mean, that's a good, it's a good, it's a good ground. So in, uh, <coughs> in so he quoted in, he cited in um, in. Uh, in AMNAT a couple of years ago, that it is reasonable to believe that genetic variation preserved by spatial balancing selection is likely to be more useful in allowing the population to respond to future challenge than other mechanisms that maintain genetic variation. But the point here is that in the context, <coughs> most often in the context of understanding <coughs> and finding signal of selection, most of the time we just totally ignore balancing selection in this type of, in this type of study. And that, that's partly because detecting balancing selection is kind of a bit more complicated, but it does exist. So balancing selection can take different forms. The form of frequency-dependent selection, heterozygote advantage, selection that varies in space and time, antagonistic evolution within species, and this of mating. So all of these different me uh, mechanisms can be interpreted in the form, one form or the other, of balancing selection. So I'll point just quickly two examples of that. It's one of my favorite figures from the, from the literature. It's work that was done in, in uh, Dmitry Petrov's group a couple of years ago. And it's a, 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 it was a, it's a temporal study that spent a couple of years. And they were the, within a single population. And they, they performed whole genome resequencing of uh, hundreds of flies in, um, in that population. And what they, what they observed is that, is that so basically we're on... Um, situation of overlap, if you want, between polygenic selection and balancing selection. Polygenic selection in the sense that what they observe across the genomes, they, they observe uh, 1,700 regions in the genome for which you had variation in allele, co-varying vari, uh, co uh, co variation in uh, allele frequencies through time, like going down in frequency from spring to fall, bumping up again, and so on, across 1,700 regions of the genome. And, uh, and this, of course, led to overall maintenance of allelic variation in, uh, in this, uh, this population. And they, they also they had uh, some experimental data to show that uh, variation at these, uh, at these loci was also associated with better performance, uh, either at uh, colder or warmer temperatures. So they, they showed that there was an adaptive basis for this. Another example um, of balancing selection, but now in the context of, um, of sexually antagonistic selection, is great work that was done by Craig Primer's uh, group published last year in Nature, <laughs> where they, um, they, um, they uh, identified the mechanism by which the uh, Atlantic salmon can solve sexual, uh, sexual conflict. 
And uh, so the, the situation is that they identified that uh, genes of, that one gene of large effect, VGGL3 gene, and they, sh they, they found that both in females and males, uh, vari allelic variation at, uh, at that gene, so two, um, two main alleles, the E allele and the L allele, uh, the, so variation, allelic variation at this gene is strongly associated with variation of age at maturity in uh, Atlantic salmon. <laughs> so actually explaining 40% of, uh, of that variation. So it's definitely a gene of, of large effect. But the interesting thing is that they also found that the, um, that the, uh, that the, the dominance of, uh, of the alleles over the other uh, change with, with sex. <laughs> so in, in, the case, in the case of female, it's the, uh, it's the L allele, the allele that is associated with later age at maturity, and they're exp they're in basically their life history reason why later, later age at maturity is more favorable for females than males in Atlantic salmon, but I'm not going to get into that. But the point is that the, point is that the, L, the L allele is dominant over the, the E allele in females such that the, 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 there's no difference in between heterozygotes and homozygotes in terms of the the, uh, the impact on, on age at maturity, whereas they observe the opposite in males. So that's, pre that's, that's pretty cool, but the point here is that even if it's one gene of large effect, this mechanism of, of different, uh, different dominance, uh, of dominance varying between sexes is a mechanism that will maintain that, uh, a balanced polymorphism within Atlantic salmon uh, population to uh, sexually antagonistic selection. <laughs> but there are several problems with uh, trying to argue that balancing selection can play an important role in adaptation. So maybe everything I said so far is just crap. Molecular adaptation occurs most commonly by self-selective sweeps. Prevailing occurrence of soft sweeps relate to polygenic architecture implying small selective effect on, uh, on each uh, target. And the maintenance of variation at polygenes somewhat is further enhanced by balancing selection. But all of that contradict theoretical predictions. Allele of small effects should be swamped by migration or lost by, by drift unless they are, uh, they are transient and that uh, organisms can cope with, uh, with transient polymorphism. So the expectation, right Sally? The expectation is that we don't, ex we don't expect that we don't, that balancing selection should contribute importantly to local adaptation. So there's a problem there. <coughs> Some smart people like Sally and Sam are perhaps solving, the, solving the, the paradox, but there's definitely a paradox because I'm an empiricist. I believe, I believe in those things. I think the data are there. I believe, I believe in this as well. So what's the solution to it? So if most alleles contribute to standing variation are of small effect and temporally transient, how then can local adaptation proceed in such situation? <coughs> so Sam came up with a possible solution uh, to, the, to this in this great paper published a couple of years ago in, in, in AMNAT. And there's no hard data supporting that yet, but I'll show you a little something on ill that perhaps goes along those lines. So basically what, uh, so what Sam did, was just simulating, uh, simulating a trait uh, under uh, a polygenic trait under selection, being under the control of 500 loci, and looking at the individual contribution of the variation of this adaptive trait uh, over uh, many many generations. So the color, so each lines represent uh, a marker. The color represents the, the, the contribution of the importance of that, of that marker to variation in the, in the adaptive trait. This blue will have a, would be a locus of, of strong effect. Uh, light yellow would be a locus that had a, a lower effect on variation in the genome. The point, so there are two things here, is that at a given point of time, you have variation in the importance of each of, each of these 500 loci, but if you look through time, <laughs> you will notice that for same locus, the, the locus may vary, the, 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 the importance of that locus in explaining variation in the phenotypic trait will vary through time and, and, and in many cases actually uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the influence of that locus will be totally lost 
and replaced by the effect of another locus that didn't have an impact on, on the phenotypic trait generations uh, earlier. So basically, the point is that there's transient polymorphism, <laughs> and there's a turnover of genes uh, that, uh, uh, that are responsible for adaptive, for adaptive divergence in this, uh, in this modeling simulation uh, experiment. And that could be possible uh, only in situations where you would have high redundancy in the genome, but it's very likely that there's high redundancy in the genome. <laughs> and coming back to the, to the yield to make the point, like I said, uh, there's not really empirical data supporting that model, but it's all, it's all pretty new. But uh, in an earlier study, uh, before the, the, the other studies, I showed you an eel. We, we, had a, we performed a lower resolution uh, SNF study based only on coding genes variation, but we had found those 12 genes that co-vary along this thermal uh, gradient, again, in the, in the, in the glass seal. <laughs> but the point here is that postdoc Pierre-Alexandre Gagnard was interested to, uh, to, to apply the, uh, to use the Levine's mo model framework, try to predict if the balance polymorphism at these 12 genes that, uh, uh, that, that, vary, uh, in, uh, that vary in space related uh, and related with uh, temperature variation, uh, if polymorphism could be maintained through time. <laughs> so we found out that for some of the genes, the prediction would be no, the alternate alleles will be, will be lost by, uh, will, just be, uh, will just be lost uh, through time. Whereas for other, for other genes, uh, the balance would, uh, would be maintained. But the overall, uh, for these 12 genes in a way that were associated with thermal variation, uh, fixation or loss uh, was predicted in 75% of the genes. It was just an exploratory exercise, but the, the point here is that it's possible uh, that in a, like in, in a species like eel, for example, if you end up with a situation like that, for eels to be able to temporally adapt to different co uh, Con, uh, thermal condition in various parts of their range here, the, uh, let's say the, the beneficial uh, or the, the, uh, the role of this gene could be replaced by another gene playing the same, playing the same role in the overall adapt, uh, uh, temporary adaptation to these different uh, environments, which would fit with uh, Yam's prediction in the model. So the point is that balancing selection and perhaps transient polymorphism associated with genome redundancy acting on polygenic traits likely play an important role in maintaining the evolutionary potential of, um, of species. And this definitely needs to be investigated further and being uh, taken into consideration by uh, empiricists like me. Okay, last part of the talk, a little something about variation. So, of course, in conservation context, uh, important diversity has been commonly uh, documented in, for example, in very isolated population with uh, no possible uh, or gene flow uh, connectivity with other population and population <laughs> with highly reduced effective population size. There's plenty of examples. And theoretically, this should severely compromise the adaptive potential of uh, of uh, individuals in such population. And there are obviously classic, uh, classical examples of that in the literature. But there are also counterexamples that this is not necessarily the case. I could have shown you uh, examples from, from fish, <laughs> but just one quick example from the channel uh, Island Fox, <laughs> one of the many papers by Bob Wayne uh, on, um, on this uh, fox. So. The bottom line is that um, in some of the Channel, I Channel Islands, like uh, St. Nicholas, uh, this fox does just very, very well. There's, there's, there's no problem, makes a living. There's no evidence of uh, pronounced uh, inbreeding depression causing uh, reduction of fitness and population collapse and so on. But when you look at the genetic diversity uh, in, in uh, this part, uh, population in, in particular, uh, compared to the gray fox, which is the, uh, the, the, the species closely, 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 closely related species from which the, the Channel Island fox are, are derived. If, if you see in light gray there, that's the genome-wide uh, patterns of genetic variation in the gray fox. And if you look for the, for the, uh, the island fox, the over, throughout the genome, uh, the general pattern is that you're there on the zero line. There's just no variation except those peaks here and there, which they don't, well, some of them associated with things like MHC, so you, ex you expect having uh, 
maintenance of allylic diversity uh, there in such region. But the point that they were making is, was that there's really very, very reduced variation genome-wide in, in the island fox compared to the gray fox, but still they strive quite well. So they made the point that conceivably phenotypic plasticity <laughs> mediated by regulatory uh, and gene epigenetic me mechanism may help compensate for the lack of genomic variation. So people are starting to think about the role of, of epigenetic in uh, conservation. <laughs> so the question is, could epigenetic variation increase the potential of species to quickly adapt to environmental change? Um, so clearly that's an option because epigenetic variation somewhat meets the requirements to be acted upon by natural uh, selection. It's ubiquitous. Uh, it controls the expression of adaptive traits. This has been well documented and can be inherited over uh, several uh, and or many ger generations. That means that's probably the black box with uh, epigenetic variation, depending on context, depending on the genes. We don't know. Uh, we don't know. I mean, it's very, there's no prediction being, being made at this point of how long uh, or, or for what genes we will observe uh, inheritance of the epigenetic variation. But anyway. So there are quite, quite a few very nice studies that have been uh, published over the last uh, couple of years associated with um, evidence for uh, epigenetic variation associated with local adaptation. For example, great work being done in Vic, uh, Vic Sort on, uh, on Valley Oak in, in California. Uh, epigenetic variation has been associated with, uh, with the adaptive uh, radiation of the Darwin finches and uh, variation in the human uh, population uh, as well. So the point being that there are papers emerging showing that epigenetic variation can be associated with uh, adaptation in, in the wild. <laughs> and there are people making the claims. I don't want to get into a debate on that here. Don't, I don't have a strict opinion on that at this point, but that epigenetics should be uh, more formally integrated into a unified uh, theory of evolution. And I guess there's pros and cons of that. I see people laughing and saying, well, is he going to get there really? No, I, I didn't take any position on that. <laughs> Uh, okay, so epigenetic variation can take different forms. Uh, so microRNA are, are involved, histone modifications, <laughs> but uh, the main, uh, so the main uh, target for most empirical studies these days that we see in the literature is studies of uh, variation in methylation at the uh, cytosine uh, nu uh, nucleotide. So the way uh, that it works, I mean, very, very basic. So that's my little animation, so I had, I had to put it. So you have so you have, like, uh, you, so you have uh, cytosine in different position in the genome. If they are unmethylated, uh, that, will, that will not, um, that will not uh, impact the, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, RNA polymerase to do its job and synthesize RNA and then leading to the expression of the genes. Whereas if a cytosine is methylated in the so-called CPG island, uh, that will uh, cause uh, inactivity of the RNA polymerase. Like this. Ta -da. Okay, so the egg, well, because I had to show you something from, from, from my lab, and it's not directly related to adaptation to the changing environment and so on, but it's kind of partly related to it, but it's still a cool study, I think. And so it has just been accepted in PNAS, and it relates to evidence for parallel epigenetic modification induced by hatchery rearing uh, in uh, coho salmon. So uh, coho salmon were, used to be a very uh, important commercial species in the U.S. and also in Canada before the 90s where <laughs> there have been major collapse of the B.C. coho uh, commercial fishery. But the uh, coho still remains one of the top recreational species in British Columbia. And as a consequence of all that, <laughs> wild stocks have been heavily supplemented by, uh, by hatcheries. And there's about 7 million juvenile coho uh, that are released uh, in BC uh, every year. <laughs> so the results I'll be presenting briefly as part of this uh, Genome, uh, Genome Canada, Genome BC, Genome Quebec uh, project that are, I'm doing in collaboration with uh, colleagues uh, Willie Davidson from SFU and Ben Coop from UVic and uh, Terry Beecham from, uh, from uh, DFO, Nanaimo, and other colleagues, namely from, um, uh, from Chile as well. There's various aspects in that program. So the goal of that one study was to assess the impact of rearing environment on the methylome of sea-migrating uh, coho salmon. 
And more specifically, we wanted to test if there was parallelism uh, imposed by uh, create, due to hatchery environment on patterns of uh, methylation. So it was a very simple uh, sampling in experimental design. So we had two river systems, Capilano and Quinsam, and two rear condition in each river. So fish, uh, the adult fish go back, come back to the, to the, to the hatchery, or they go back to the, to the wild environment, and, and young fish are being produced either in hatchery uh, and in the wild. And they grow there, and eventually, when they reach the, the small, uh, small stage, when they get into this uh, uh, transition to be adapted to, um, to salt water, they will migrate, down, migrate uh, down towards the ocean for their feeding uh, migration. So we had 10 fish per group, so N of 40, uh, 10 uh, hatchery reared, 10 wild fish for each of the two, of the two rivers, and we sampled the smolts uh, in the river when they were migrating uh, down for their feeding uh, migration. And we use this uh, reduced representation bisulfite sequencing uh, method to, um, to quantify patterns of document patterns of uh, methylation, different, uh, variation in methylation uh, in those samples. <laughs> and the goal was to identify DMRs, differentially methylated regions. And because we have access to the coho draft genome, we could do some functional annotation of regions of the genome that are differentially methylated. So quickly, uh, those are results at the DNA level, not at the epigenetic level <coughs> uh, first. So we wanted to see what was the extent of genetic uh, differences between hatchery reared and reared fish within a river and between rivers. And that was based on uh, 20,000 uh, highly uh, stringently uh, filtered SNPs. So basically what you see here, uh, two symbols, uh, square uh, corresponding to, uh, to Quinsam, uh, circle to Capilano, yellow corresponding to hatchery uh, reared um, fish, and blue to uh, wild or, or natural origin fish. So what we see at the DNA level is basically there's no difference whatsoever between fish that were born in hatchery and fish that were born in, uh, in the wild, and even applying all, any genome scan and any type polygenic, you name them, there was just no signs of selective effect differentiating, uh, or neutrally, uh, as a matter of fact, differentiating fish that were born in hatchery or fish that were born in the, in, in the wild within a river. But there was a sex effect because we did not filter out for sex link markers in the data set, so there was a sex effect. But uh, there was no effect whatsoever. So, and, but there was obviously, uh, and that was, that was predictable, uh, strong differences between, uh, between uh, both rivers. But there was no environmental effect uh, whatsoever at the DNA level. So when we looked at the methylation level, that the story was quite, uh, quite different to some extent. <laughs> so now we still, had the, we still had a river effect. So if you see like, uh, underneath the, the green line here, we have essentially all squares, so fish from one river, independently of if they were born in hatchery or in the wild, and then circles on the, on the other side. So there's, there's a river effect. But the rearing environment effect was as pronounced as, uh, as the river effect was this, this time, explaining 8% of the variation, just like river was explaining 8% of the variation. So we have an overall 16% of the variation being explained by river and rearing environment. <laughs> and so... It's not obviously like totally clear cut, but basically like in the upper part here, it's dominated by blue, fish that were born in natural environment, uh, in, independent of the river of origin, and fish that were born in hatchery, independent of, uh, of the river of origin as well. So essentially, it shows that you have, to some extent, parallelism in patterns of methylation that was generated by the hatchery environment that creates these differences between the wild fish and the hatchery fish uh, in both rivers combined. And another interesting observation is that, so overall we could identify uh, statistically 100 uh, differentially methylated uh, regions, and out of these 189 uh, show a statistical signal of hypermethylation in the hatchery origin fish versus the natural origin fish. So there's a general tendency uh, of what's different in terms of methylation in hatchery between wild to be hypermethylated, and the best interpretation of that is that that should cause a reduction in the expression of genes that are located in these 100 uh, 
uh, DMRs region. And as a matter of fact, uh, these comprise some important uh, functions that could be uh, relevant to <laughs> a successful out-migrating uh, migration of these smolt. Uh, immunity response transcription, uh, postsynaptic controls, and signaling. One example of, um, of that is the serotonin 5-HT1C receptor that plays an important role in the regulation of appetite, feeding behavior, and uh, responses to stress. So basically what you have here is that uh, positioning, positioning of um, differentially methylated uh, region in this region, just upstream of the, of, of the gene. So it could be in the regulatory region controlling the expression of that gene. And uh, what you see is that you have more red dots in the upper part of the, of the graph and more blue dots in the lower part of the graph that relates to, that illustrate uh, higher uh, methylation in the hatchery fish uh, in, in yellow versus the wild fish uh, in, uh, in blue. So that's one example of the type of results we, we observe. So again, that does not, this example does not directly relate, um, this, this may, may be relate more to acclimatization and so on. So it's not the point of making the, the, the point that this is an adaptive response. It's just something I wanted to show you. But with the, uh, the examples that I talk about that from the literature on various uh, taxonomic groups, I think makes the point that epigenetics clearly can represent a potentially important source of adaptive variation um, in the wild, if that sort of pattern is being inherited uh, in the long term and then selection uh, uh, act on it. So in summary, situation perhaps is a bit less gloomy than currently uh, assumed the way we see things. <laughs> and that's because adaptive evolution seems to almost never involve the fixation of beneficial uh, alleles and therefore loss of alternate uh, variation. Variation is being maintained but in different frequencies in, in different population. And that's because selection mainly operates in the form of subsweeps, because evolution proceeds more commonly via a high number of small effect polygenes with weak effect on each polygene, not leading to the loss of genetic variation. Balancing selection and perhaps transient polymorphism associated with redundancy in the genome is perhaps more common than currently considered and may play a role in the maintenance of, uh, of genetic variation. And finally, epigenetic variation also likely plays a role a uh, major role in uh, adaptation and perhaps rapid adaptation. So my message to, I'm a poor empiricist, so my message to theoreticians is that these mechanisms must be integrated into future modeling efforts towards better predicting the potential of species to cope with environmental change. <laughs> well, it was time to finish, I guess. Anyway, <laughs> life is complex. I thank my lab. That's my dog, Border Collie. Well, I guess you know Border Collie, they've, they've been bred to herd sheep. I train her to her graduate students and postdoc, <laughs> so they remain out of trouble. Thank you. Yep. Michael. Time for lunch. Yeah. Why, why, why is it good to have them inactive in the hatchery? Yeah, that's why, I, that's, why, that's, that's why I didn't want to claim anything about adaptive, non-adaptive with that example. I guess, the, I guess the, I just wanted to show something about epigenetic variation and that, that hatchery do something about changing meth uh, methylation. The consequences of that at this point is just, I mean, we had to tone down our discussion anyway in that in that in that paper. So I guess those are, I mean, the most like what what the hatcheries have is common is definitely like over overcrowding, and that has been this, the main hype. But people like have been like reduction of fitness of of hatchery fish has been largely associated. So what there must be some selection going on in hatchery. But the thing is that you have ninety percent, eighty five percent, ninety percent survival rate. So there still can be selective effect, but. By the most part, I mean, you rear fish in hatcheries because they survive very well. So perhaps reduction in fitness in the wild is associated with these methylation change, but it has to be documented and studied in future studies. So I don't want to make any uh, adaptive inference. The, I, what, I, what I want to make is that, the point I want to make is that hatchery has an impact on methylation, maybe consequential.
Ya. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, all the the the, the, deta the details of that is uh, is basically. I think that uh, they are they are the same when they quickly diff the different thermal regime that they face cause differential mortality, and very quickly you have these change in allele frequency. So when and so in that paper we had graphs showing that if you look like at the correlation between allelic variation for some of those genes and the, the water temperature where we collected them, uh, say, uh, 30 days before, 20 days before, uh, right when we collected them, 10 days after, 20 days after, you had the peak of correlation at the time we collected them. So suggesting that the temperature that they encountered when they got there quickly was a selective agent creating this change in allele frequencies. Can you repeat that? I'm not sure I got the, like the beginning of your. Yeah. 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 No, that's that's a good question. I, I'd say like any. And we're like this, this, this work by Sam was basically focusing on genes of small, of small effects. So I would say that most studies don't even pay attention to this type of variation. But let's say the same phenomenon happened with genes of larger effects that you could detect with genome scan. Yeah, there's, there's perhaps a possibility that because of genome redundancy and transient polymorphism or that, that some genes in some population well, different genes in different population may somewhere somehow play the same adaptive role and, and may create, like, I mean, most of the time, these genome scan studies, of course, you see signal of parallelism, but I would make the point that the general rule is that you have more often signal of non-parallelism of genes under selection across population than, than seeing strong parallelism. So perhaps this has something to do, but this is an area that needs really to be further investigated by theoreticians. One more? Yeah. I have a question about the characteristic point at the end. Is there a need to take into account polygenic traits? I'm wondering how the work of people like Nick Barton and Mike Prince and stuff finding that has failed to has failed to dodge the Tucson theory of cluster traits. Well, I, I don't think they have failed. I think, I, so remember we are in the context, what I'm saying is that models that have been developed to trying to make some prediction related to environmental change and can species, will species be able to cope with that? So perhaps the answer to that is that perhaps these modeling efforts have not paid, maybe because of the complexity also of it, I've not paid a, enough attention to all the you know, quant amazing quantitative genetic development that Landy had done or what Nick Bantor, uh, Barton has done. So I guess that's I, I'm, I'm far from me the point saying that they have failed, <laughs> but perhaps they have not been influential enough in the development of model being, being developed in the purpose of understanding the effect of, uh, the, of environmental change in, on the potential of species to adapt and maintain adaptive variation. Sure. Talk. I, I like your last slide the best, though, of any of them. <laughs> I know that. Uh, I just want to remind you that Louis is here till December 10th, up in room 315. And with Roy Holzman, we're developing a bit of a fish critical mass up in the third floor, which warms the cockles of my heart. And I know he'd be love to talk to any of you. Yeah, don't hesitate. I'll, sure. Absolutely. Well, thanks again, Louis. Thank you.